In early May of 1918, reports of a mysterious disease began raging throughout Spain and slowly spreading across Europe. By August, this new disease seemingly had been carried across the ocean, arriving in the United States. Some reports stated that the disease actually originated in a Kansas army base among soldiers preparing for World War I. Wherever it began, by summer 1918, it seemed to fade, only to return with a vengeance in the fall. By September, the disease had made a comeback and hit the east coast of the U.S. first. It then spread west, hitting Midwestern metropolitan areas and eventually making its way into the countryside. Within two weeks of entering the United States, the disease had spread across the country, especially in military institutions like Camp Devens in Massachusetts, which had roughly 6,000 cases reported at the time. Influenza spread so quickly that the government became worried about the effects of the disease and began mobilizing all of the forces to fight the approaching pandemic known as the Spanish Influenza. 100 years later and the world is undergoing an eerily similar experience. As the 1918 influenza epidemic spread, on September 22nd, New York City's Board of Health added flu to the list of reportable diseases and required all flu cases in the city to be isolated. The Surgeon General Rupert Blue warned the public that while the epidemic had been mild in some places, mortality was common and asked the public to be cautious. Military camps continued to be a hot spot for the disease. More than 14,000 flu cases were reported in Camp Devens, resulting in over 700 deaths. At this time, influenza levels in Evansville were low, but that was soon to change. Influenza hit military camps in the United States first, and continued to hit them hard throughout the pandemic. Evansville's first exposure to death resulting from influenza came not from the city itself, but at a distance. One of the first Evansville boys to die was a 21-year-old soldier named Lester Fisher who gained a reputation as the youngest entrepreneur in Evansville when he opened a cigar factory at the age of 19. He closed the business on June 18th to join the Navy and was training at the Great Lakes Training Center in Illinois where he contracted the disease and quickly died on September 26th. His father rushed to his side as soon as word reached Evansville that he had fallen ill, but his mother wasn't allowed to visit until two days later and only for a few hours because of strict quarantine at the camp. The next day, Lester Fisher died and his body was returned to Evansville for his funeral and was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. Sadly, many more young men were soon to follow. The newspaper kept a tally of the young soldiers who had died from the flu, and by October 15th, 14 local boys had died. Oscar Dannenberg, a 24-year-old soldier who had been married only six months, died not in battle, but of the flu at Camp Custer in Michigan after being in the service for only three months. Most of these men never made it into battle, dying before they had a chance. They may not have died in the war, but they were up against an even deadlier killer. Yet the first soldier to die in World War I as far as the United States combat fatality was James Bethel Gresham, who grew up in Evansville. And in November of 1917, on November the 3rd, in the early morning hours of 1917, Gresham, along with two others, are going to become the first three combat fatalities suffered by the United States in the Great War. Word of this is going to reach the United States in the ensuing days and reach his mother in days following. But also during this period, the flu pandemic is going on. That is killing oh, millions and millions of people worldwide. The 1918 influenza was unlike previous versions of the flu. Rather than disproportionately affecting the very young and the very old, the Spanish flu heavily affected young, healthy adults. The fact that young, healthy men and women could fall ill and die within a week instilled terror in the community. The disease spread so rapidly because it had multiplied in the lungs of those infected with an incubation period of only one to three days. Every cough or sneeze from an infected person blew thousands of droplets of the disease into the air, landing on surfaces and being inhaled by others. In most cases of the flu, the onset was sudden and jarring, and within hours of onset of symptoms, Temperatures would rise to over 100 degrees accompanied by a dry cough. The fever would last an average of three days with a range of symptoms from sore throat to body aches. And occasionally, influenza would develop into pneumonia from a secondary bacterial infection. Half of those cases ended in death. Throughout the influenza pandemic in Evansville, the major push by the government was merely for citizens not to panic. In early October, before the number of cases began to rise, the advice given by the paper was that the best way to combat it was to not worry about it. 
Later, at the peak of the first wave, the public was again asked not to worry. Evansville physicians placated the people by saying the seriousness of the increased number of influenza patients should not alarm the public, and that the more you fear the disease, the more likely you are to get it. The first death inside the city of Evansville came on September 29th and was a 70-year-old black man named Robert Bridgeford. Although this was the first death of influenza in the city, the papers only mentioned his death in passing and the articles received little attention. Anna Wittenbreaker, an Evansville High School student and daughter of a prominent attorney, was diagnosed with the disease on October 2nd, and although her symptoms were mild and she recovered quickly, the story caught attention from the press. While news of the war would continue to dominate the papers, the flu in Evansville had made the papers. By October 6, 1918, the Evansville government decided it was time to take action. 140 cases and three deaths had been reported in a week, and numbers were on the rise. Dr. Porter Linthicum asked local physicians to make a daily report of cases to send to the Board of Health. He also ordered the public utility company to properly ventilate streetcars in an effort to reduce the spread of the disease, and warned the public to be cautious and open windows. Evansville took a more drastic step by enforcing a flu order that went into place on October 11th. Flu victims were quarantined, churches and theaters were closed, and dances and parties were banned. There were few complaints about the ban, although there were many telephone calls to the Sanitary Bureau asking about specifics from whether small schools could remain open to whether hay rides would still be allowed. The answer to both was no. Linthicum warned that the ban would be enforced for everyone, no matter what their beliefs, because public gatherings give flu germs an excellent chance to operate. Because the flu ban was so abrupt and schools were closed with so little warning on October 11th, it was unsure how teachers were supposed to proceed. Work in schools was harder because they had to make up the material they had missed that semester, and teachers were responsible for making sure their children had covered all the material. The unexpected closure was a blessing for construction workers at F.J. Wright's High School. Only the first floor of the school was ready for the students when it opened on September 3rd. The closure allowed workers to complete construction of the second floor before students returned to the building. Schools were due to reopen on October 11th, but the flu ban was extended until November 2nd. Luckily, teachers in Evansville continued to get paid during the enforced flu vacation. Christmas break was shortened to just two days, Christmas and New Year's, to make up for the lost time. Even as the city of Evansville began to take action against influenza, school sports marched on as long as possible. The influenza ban did not apply to outdoor games, and so the Evansville High School football team, under the instruction of Coach Plum, still had practices, which they moved to the mornings because of the flu vacation, and planned on going to football games. But unfortunately, Kentucky's ban on gatherings did not allow for football games. With grit and determination, Coach Plum continued the football season throughout the epidemic. On November 9th, after the ban was lifted, the team was supposed to play a game in Louisville, but the game was canceled due to Plum organizing a game of his own. He asked the Carmi and Owensboro teams if they wanted to play without any success, but was finally able to convince Henderson to play a game. In order to play, Evansville High School had to lend players to Henderson to even the teams, but a game was played which is all Coach Plum was looking for. Evansville High School scored 36 points to Henderson's zero. Masks became a point of debate during the 1918 flu pandemic. When the Indiana Board of Health issued their warning against influenza, they suggested that counties tell the people, when compelled to cough or sneeze, to hold a cloth or paper handkerchief over their nose. Evansville did not require masks in public, but some companies decided to have employees wear them anyways. The girls at the telephone company and the canteen made their own masks created from three layers of fabric to wear to work every day. The masks made customers feel safe while visiting the establishments and fear of the spreading the flu was diminished. At the time, there was no definitive evidence that masks made a difference in the number of infected citizens, so many believed they were unnecessary or even harmful. J.R. Duncan, an Evansville merchant, claimed the sight of people in masks would frighten the women and create an undue fear. Masks were required in the temporary Elks Hospital for all volunteers, patients, and visitors. On the 23rd of October 1918, as the flu continued its rampage through the city, Red Cross authorities gathered to discuss the location of a temporary flu hospital. By the 26th, the Elks home had been turned into a temporary hospital. It took the Red Cross a mere six hours to complete, wowing the Evansville public. Motor trucks and wagons belonging to the public schools were used to haul furniture and equipment needed for the temporary hospital, 
and janitors from the city schools helped nurses scrub and sterilize the space. Because all of the medical personnel or visitors at the Oaks home had to wear a mask, they had to wear coveralls or they had to wear a cotton gown as protective equipment from illness. Because one of the biggest challenges of the flu epidemic was keeping your healthcare personnel healthy. The hospital initially had 23 beds, but by the end of the first night, this number was inadequate. Miss E. M. Bush, director of the Red Cross, stated, Our hospital is not a place of charity. It is being run for the good of us all to help trample out the flu. Although many of them had little to no medical experience, many teachers volunteered their time working in the Elks Hospital and Red Cross. Some of these women worked full days to support the community throughout the pandemic. When schools reopened, the Elks Hospital and the Red Cross desperately needed more volunteers because many of the ones they had were teachers who needed to go back to teaching. In early November, as the schools were reopening, the flu had reached its first peak. Half of the deaths reported from October 20th to October 27th had been caused by influenza, and the number of deaths had outmatched any previous week. At the time, nobody understood what caused the flu, which led to a variety of theories and responses from government officials to laymen. This lack of consensus led to hundreds of cures from getting lots of fresh air to salves claiming to, quote, fool the flu. With so many cures being pushed by advertisers, Surgeon General Rupert Blue warned, the health service urges the public to remember that there is as yet no specific cure for the influenza and that many of the alleged cures and remedies do more harm than good. Whiskey was a common cure for influenza, but by mid-October, the New York Board of Health had warned the public against the use of whiskey for influenza. Physicians in Evansville warned against the use of whiskey as a cure and refused to provide it to patients who asked. Evansville men, still hoping to get whiskey, traveled to Henderson, which was still a wet state whereas Indiana was already dry, but returned empty-handed because the saloons there had been closed as well. On November 2, 1918, the flu ban was lifted and many hoped life would go back to normal. Children went back to schools, people could gather in groups again, and the numbers were decreasing day by day. Then on November 11th, World War I ended and people gathered in the streets to celebrate. In Evansville, uh, there will be spontaneous celebrations in the streets. There will also be an organized celebration that will take place on that evening. Uh, they will have a parade up Main Street and it will consist of the high school band, the Evansville High School Band, the only high school in Evansville at that point, uh, Buckskin Manufacturing Company, their girls' drum corps will be involved in that, the Boy Scouts, churches, and there will be many people involved in this. The, the newspaper reports that people were carrying Roman candles and firing them off. People were firing blank pistols into the air. Uh, people in cars were banging pots and pans. There were people in many ways that were celebrating this occasion. The end. For one brief but foreseeably fatal moment, Richard Collier, author of The Plague of the Spanish Lady, noted, the people relax their vigilance, all prohibitions concerning public gathering, the do's and don'ts of hygiene were cast aside. From that point onward, numbers began to rise again. In Indiana during the last two weeks of November, the peak of the second wave, cases went from an average of 1,456 cases a day to 2,371. On November 20th, the Evansville Courier reported talk of a second flu ban placed on the city. Merchants and theater men believed a second ban would negatively affect their business more than others and argued to the Board of Health that there should be no ban. Evansville debated whether or not to close the schools again at this time, but after some consideration they decided that it would be safer for children to be in schools where their actions would be watched rather than at home or on the streets. At this time, Mayor Bossy put out a warning to the Evansville people saying that every precaution must be taken against the flu, and unless the disease is checked, it will be necessary to enforce the closing order again. He stated that only by cooperation can we hope to fight the disease. By December, the influenza epidemic had mostly passed. There was fear that the cold weather would spark another wave of the disease, but overall, the numbers steadily declined throughout the month. It came as a shock to the Evansville public when on the 3rd of December, Mrs. Bossy, the wife of Mayor Bossy, fell ill with influenza. At this time, the mayor was out of town attending a meeting of the War Industries Board and was not aware of his wife's illness or admittance to the Walker Hospital. On December 8th, the Elks home reverted back to a clubhouse and was no longer needed as a temporary hospital. On the 9th, 
Mayor Bossy returned to Evansville and was greatly relieved that his wife's condition has already been improving. After three weeks, Mrs. Bossy was able to sit up and continued improving until the 21st when she was finally moved back into her own home. After his wife's illness had improved, Mayor Bossy commented, she's lucky to be here and I'm lucky to have her. Mrs. Bossy has been very ill. It's illustrative of the fact that the disease didn't care if you were rich, it didn't care if you were poor, it did not care if you are a prominent citizen or if you were just a factory worker. You know, it was indiscriminate in who it targeted and who fell victim to it. Uh, there were many prominent citizens of Evansville who died in the flu and many more who were, um, who became ill with the flu. By 1919, the flu had mostly ended, although there were still some cases from time to time. Eventually, World War I overshadowed the flu as the epidemic slowly faded into the background. However, the healthcare system was formalized due to flu, and practices set in place during this time continued to affect the nation for years to come. Building codes became stricter, including a need for air circulation, and high schools added hygiene classes to help prevent the spread of diseases. According to the CDC, 675,000 Americans died from the influenza, but due to misreporting and many deaths from pneumonia as a result of the flu, the true number undoubtedly should be higher. Nearly 30% of the deaths in the U.S. in 1918 were attributed to the flu, and the life expectancy dropped by 12 years. In Indiana, the State Board of Health reported that there were not less than 350,000 cases of influenza throughout the course of the epidemic, and over 10,000 Hoosiers lost their lives. Still, the numbers don't tell the story of the human toll that the influenza inflicted. That toll may best be seen through the experience of one war mother in Evansville, Miss Alice Dodd. While Mrs. Dodd's son, James Bethel Gresham, was the first American soldier killed in World War I, he was not her only loss. As she and the city prepared to mark the one-year anniversary of her son's death, she faced the loss of a second son. John Gresham died on October 24th and left behind not only a grieving mother, but also a wife and four children, including a newborn son. He was laid to rest one day shy of the first anniversary of his brother's death. Just two weeks later, Mrs. Dodd lost her daughter, Nola Lowy, who was just 31 years old. Mrs. Lowy lived with her mother in the little memorial home that was built with the donations from the people of Evansville. Both of her children were taken by the flu.